you for these instrumentalists and what they mean to us and how they lead us in worship. Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, have compassion upon us and grant us peace. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's all stand up, shake the rain off, uh, and we're, we're going to worship our Lord and Savior. And y'all, this is a fun song, a traditional hymn that we've done for years, and I want us to enjoy as we sing together, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart, and, and others, but that one. I want y'all to sing out, and if you're not smiling, I'm going to be staring right at you. Okay, here we go, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart.
Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here at First Baptist this morning. What a privilege that we have to celebrate uh, baptism in this worship service this morning. Um, I, I love the words of that song that we were just uh, singing, Oh, How He Loves You and Me. He gave His life. What more could He give? He gave His life that we might have eternal life. And so that's what we're celebrating with these who will be baptized this morning. We have three that will be baptized this morning. And that's what we're celebrating, the transforming uh, change that they have experienced in their hearts that Christ brought them because of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not, uh, the, bab the water doesn't save them. It's, uh, it, it's, a, it's an act of obedience that the Bible tells us that to proclaim our faith publicly we, um, we, we follow the Lord in baptism so that the world knows that we have died to an old way of life and we've been raised to walk in a new way of life. And so that's what we're celebrating this morning. And it's such a privilege for me to be able to uh, have a part in this service this morning. So let's pray and just ask God's presence in this place at this particular time. Father, Thank you for this time that we have to celebrate with these who are being baptized today with their families. I pray, God, that you would <clears throat> uh, just make this a spiritual marker in their lives today. May they, uh, throughout their lives, look on this day as a day when they publicly declared their faith and, and love for you, their faith in and their love for you, Father. I thank you for what they do. Help them to grow as a disciple of Christ, and may they be warriors for you, loving you with all their hearts in the days ahead, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask uh, Mayor Grace to come and as well, and I think this may be um, a celebration for family that may not be expecting this, but her mom is joining us this morning. And I am so excited about what God is doing in their lives. And uh, as, as an act of leadership and modeling for Mary Grace, who has given her heart to the Lord, uh, Sandy, I'm going to ask that uh, I baptize you first, okay? So, Mary Grace, if you'll just step back. Sandy, come. I love what the Lord has been doing and continues to do in your life, Sandy. Um, you've followed him. And your journey is a, is a journey of, of growing faith. And the Lord continues to reveal himself to you over and over and over. And we celebrate that today. And so, as, as I always do with everyone who is baptized, I want to ask you two questions. Do you confess your faith in the Lord Jesus today? Yes, I do. Do you promise to learn of his ways and to love him and follow him all your life? Then it's my joy and privilege to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. <laughs> Mary Grace, your mom has just declared her faith and in, in love for the Lord Jesus. She is modeling for you what a godly woman is supposed to do, follow the Lord. And so I want to ask you, do you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Do you promise to learn of his love, uh, to love him and follow, his, uh, follow him all the days of your life? Yes. And it's my joy and privilege to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. That's a, that's a mother and daughter who are sisters in Christ. Taylor, come and baptize them, brother. All right. We're going to continue in our celebration uh, with Miss Catherine Steen. So come on down, Catherine. And I baptized Catherine's older sister just a few, uh, 
just a few months ago. It was actually back in January. And I think this is a, a picture of, we never want a kid to just get baptized because a sibling has gotten baptized. But it is a picture of a sibling sharing Christ with another sibling. And so this is, we always see generation to generation, but that doesn't always just mean it's got to be older to younger, younger to older, right? It can also be, uh, it can also be sibling to sibling. And so Catherine, I'm going to ask you, do you profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Based on that profession of faith, I baptize you as my sister in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ and raised to walk in new life. What a wonderful way to continue our celebration uh, today. As we continue our time of worship, today is a day uh, that we welcome those of you that are guests and visitors. I know that it is Father's Day, and there are many of you that may be here visiting family and such as we know of many folks who are out other places visiting their family. If you're here as a guest, would you do us a favor and an honor? The worship guide that you received when you came on our campus on the very far right-hand side, there's a little tear-off. If you would fill out that information and return it to us in one of two ways. Either A, by placing it in the offering plate in just a moment as your gift to us. Or secondly, we have a guest reception immediately following the service. I'd love the opportunity to meet you face to face. And if you'll bring that card with you, I will exchange it for a free book. Well, today is Father's Day, and we have celebrated uh, that our Heavenly Father is a good, good Father. And none of this would happen today if it were not for a resurrected Jesus and an empty tomb. In just a moment, we're going to celebrate that. So let's pray together. Lord, as we gather in this place, you truly are a good, good Father. Your grace, your mercy, your love is unfathomable to us. But yet we realize then, we recognize that it is because of the resurrected Jesus that we can have that relationship and we can celebrate your love for us. Help us at this time to not only to cherish, but to focus on what you have done out of love for us in the empty tomb. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.
I'm out of breath. <laughs> and breathless is the same in the presence of our Lord. We're going to continue worshiping this morning as we sing once again a familiar song that, boy, if you don't lift your spirits during this, you're, you're not on fire, your wood's definitely wet. This is an awesome song, and that's Stand Together as we praise our Lord and Savior through It Is Well With My Soul. <laughs>
Pray with me, please. Father God, we thank you for the way that you've shown yourself this morning, for the way that you've demonstrated your love for us with the baptisms that we saw. Father, we just thank you for the fact that by your life and by your death and your resurrection, we have an avenue to know you and to be a part of your family, to be a part of you, to be a part of your work. And Father, for all that we are, all that you've created us to be, and all that you will enable us to do, we praise you for it, dear God. And Father, as we give you these tithes and these offers this morning, Lord, we pray that you would work in our hearts to draw us closer to you. And Father, that these things would be given so that your work would expand. Oh, it's in your precious, glorious name. Amen. Amen. When Brian asked me a number of weeks back to sing this particular Sunday, um, I said yes and had intentions of having some of my family or maybe men join me. Uh, and then soon after, he asked me to lead worship that Sunday. I was like, I did the math and said, ooh, that's falling on the same Sunday. So it kind of put me in a kind of a uh, quandary as to what it's thing. So I prayed about it. And I said, it's Father's Day. And I thought back to my father that um, just adored the old hymns, adored the old hymns. And, and we would sing around the piano, and he would just love to watch. So and listen and sing with us sometimes. And so I said, you know, I don't have anybody sing with me, but I love gospel quartet. I love quartet. So I, I got with Ryan and Taylor and came up with something a little creative, but the purpose is to worship our Lord through these traditional hymns. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. Marvelous grace of our Lord. that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount how poured there with the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, such grace, grace that will pardon I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living. Just
Let's pray together. Lord, as we celebrate this day, that there's a day coming that when we've been with you 10,000 years, it will be as if we just had begun. Lord, I pray that this day would be in conjunction with those days, that what you promised us, what you ask us to pray, that it would be your will not just in heaven but on earth, that we would today experience a bit of heaven while on earth. Challenge us, convict us, comfort us through the reading and the teaching and the preaching of your word. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. This morning I want to encourage you to open your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 4. And if you're a first time guest or visitor, or maybe you haven't been with us in the last couple weeks, we as a church body, as we as a family of faith, we are going where very few Baptist churches have gone before. We are studying the person and the role and the work of the Holy Spirit. And that being said, today we come to a subject matter uh, that is possibly the most fiercely debated and most disagreed aspect of who and the role of the Holy Spirit in our life. We're going to talk about what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now there are those in some traditions and friends of mine that are so interested in and so uh, promotive of being filled with the Holy Spirit that they advocate, they encourage activities and behaviors and such that are far in excess of what Scripture shares. However, I dare say most of us in this place don't fall on that side uh, of the equation. There's a majority of folks who claim the name of Jesus who unfortunately are so scared, so bothered by, and so concerned of what might happen if they're actually filled with the Holy Spirit, is that they ignore it altogether. It reminds me of one of the most famous phrases in our culture's recent history. It was on April the 13th, 1970, where we heard this famous phrase, Houston, we have a problem. In fact, that's been utilized in the business context, personal lives, etc. But on that mission known as Apollo 13, that statement was utilized to recognize that something was awry, something was wrong, something needed to be addressed. When it comes to the issue of being filled with the Holy Spirit, I dare say that that statement from April the 13th, 1970, as quoted, is incorrect. You may not have known it, but I actually quoted it improperly. It has become a part of our culture as Houston, we have a problem, when what the astronaut actually said was, Houston, we've had a problem. In other words, our struggle with being filled with the Holy Spirit does not have to be a struggle of today. We can relegate it to issues of yesterday if we address how to be biblically properly filled with the Holy Spirit. That statement came from the famed Apollo 13 mission. And we're going to show you a brief one-minute clip of how they resolved the problem that they had had. We have a situation brewing with the carbon dioxide. We had a CO2 filter problem on the lunar module. Five filters on the limb, which are meant for two guys for a day and a half. So I told the doctor. You're already up to eight on the gauges. Anything over 15, and you get impaired judgment, blackouts, the beginnings of brain asphyxia. What about the scrubbers on the command module? They take square cartridges. The ones on the limb are round. <laughs> Tell me this isn't a government operation. This just isn't the contingency we've remotely looked at. Those CO2 levels are going to be getting toxic. Well, I suggest you gentlemen invent a way to put a square peg in a round hole. Rapidly. <laughs> this one and we got to come through we got to find a way to make this fit into the hole for this using nothing but that let's get it organized okay okay let's build a filter better get some coffee going too someone i love that line we got to find a way to get this into a hole that was made for this with all that we have before us when it comes to the subject matter, the idea of being filled with the Holy Spirit, allow me to share with you some great news. We've got all the material and all the supplies we need right here in the Word of God. So allow us to go to Acts chapter 4. Let's see, what does the Bible say about being filled with the Holy Spirit? 
I'm going to begin in verse 1, and just for a sake of context, in chapter 3, uh, there was a man who was lame, who was impotent, that Peter and John had the opportunity and the privilege of seeing healed. He begged them for money. They said, silver and gold have we not, but Jesus Christ we do. There are those that came upon them that struggled and, and were continuing to mock them and ridicule them. In verse 1 it says, and as they spoke unto the people, the priests and the captains of the temple, the Sadducees, they came upon them. Being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They laid hands on them and they put them into the hold for the next day and it was now about evening tide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed and the number of the men was about 5,000. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and the elders and the scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were the kindred of the high priest, they were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, he said unto them, You rulers of the people and you elders of Israel. He began to explain to them the power of the resurrected Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit. When you get to verse 13, it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled. They took knowledge of them. Listen to this. That they had been with Jesus. It is at that point that the mocking increases, the ridicule increases, the persecution increases. So much so that the apostles gather up together, beginning in verse 23, and they pray and they call out to God to deliver them. I want you to notice verse 31. And when they prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. They spoke the word of God with boldness. Now, in this chapter of Scripture alone, there are two instances where it describes individuals, particularly one whom we know as Simon Peter, being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so I want us to ask ourselves three very important questions today. Question number one, why is it important that we be filled with the Holy Spirit? Question number two, how does that happen in our lives? And question number three, what does it look like when and if it occurs? Let's begin with the why. Why is it important to talk about this subject matter? Why do we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, the first reason is it is, quote, progressive. Now, if you were with us some weeks ago when we studied Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, which says, be not drunk with wine, which is excess, but be filled with the Holy Ghost, we talked about there is a distinct difference between the presence of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit working and moving in our lives. When you or I or anybody else realize that they have sinned, they have rebelled, they've gone against the ways and the will and the word of God, they recognize they have sinned and they call upon Jesus Christ alone to forgive them and save them. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within them. They become the temple of the Holy Ghost. In other words, the moment you're saved, you have the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. What we see as demonstrated in Acts chapter 4, is you may have the presence, but it is the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through your lives that is what we might call progressive. Now allow me for the sake and the brevity of time just to walk through a few passages with you using an example known as Simon Peter. In John chapter 20, just days after Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, he comes into the upper room, he breathes on them, and he says, receive you the Holy Spirit. Some days later, right before his ascension, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus makes this statement. He says, tarry here or wait here till the Holy Ghost comes upon you, then you shall be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Seven days later, the day of Pentecost arrived. And in verse 4 of chapter 2 of the book of Acts, it says they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they began to speak with other tongues. Pentecost comes and goes, 3,000 people are saved. The lame man in Acts chapter 3 is healed. And all of a sudden, the scribes, the Pharisees are coming upon these men. And they are filled with the Holy Ghost, not once, but twice in Acts chapter 4. So in just a period of a small amount of time, one who we know as Simon Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit on three different occasions. Now there are some. That would say when you see in the scriptures that someone was filled with the Holy Spirit. That means that they got saved. Well, that can't be. 
That means that Peter got saved four times in four chapters. It also means that there would have been some incident in his life that would advocate us making that proposition, and there's nothing indicated of the sort. There are others that say, well, to be filled with the Spirit means that you were backslidden. You were out of the will of God, you were in rebellion, and you repented and you came back into fellowship with the Lord. Well, that can't be the case because you don't find anywhere in the book of Acts, at least the first, first four chapters, where the apostle Peter is any way remotely out of fellowship with the Lord. Here's what you see, and this is the definition of being filled with the Holy Spirit. A progressive yielding to the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. In Acts chapter 2, 3,000 got saved. In Acts chapter 4, 5,000 got saved. What you see is the progressive yielding to the Lord doing more in His and potentially more in our lives. Speaking of potential, what does this mean? This means that you and I have access to all of the power and all of the resources of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Think about it in these terms. In your home... Thankfully, in our culture, we have what we know as indoor plumbing. We have bathrooms. We have kitchens. We even have outdoor spigots to where we can turn on and turn off the water at our pleasure and will. But you do realize, and young people, I highly suggest you don't do this when you get home. You can go into your bathroom, and you can turn on the faucet, and if you leave it long enough, the entire water reservoir will empty out into your bathtub. Please, young people, don't do that when you get home. But how many of us, let's look at this spiritually, how many of us do that in our lives? Sunday morning, turn it on, Monday, turn it off. Wednesday night, turn it on, Wednesday, Thursday morning, turn it off. In other words, when it comes to the yielding of, when it comes to the filling of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we have access, if we will leave the spigot open 24-7, we will see happen in our lives what we saw happen in Simon Peter's life, where he progressively saw the Lord do more and more in his life. Now, that's why it's important to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The second question is this, how does that happen? Well, in Acts chapter 4, we have four things that are present. Now, I want you to hear me clearly. Not all four of these items have to be present at one time for somebody to be filled with the Holy Spirit. They do not have to happen in a successive order. In fact, I dare say you see one or more of these items anytime somebody is mentioned being filled with the Holy Spirit. The first item is the aspect of prayer. Now, the reason that I put asterisks by this is that you do not see that explicitly mentioned at the beginning of Acts chapter 4, even though you see it toward the end. And it was definitively a part of the equation in Acts chapter 1 and 2, for they prayed for an entire seven days before the first mentioning of being filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. And by the way, if you don't believe in the power of prayer then you haven't been around First Baptist the last few days. For those of you who do not know, and there's very few people who do not, this last Wednesday night, at what we know as Family Night of Vacation Bible School, because we had a sports theme that was taking place, uh, we had an individual on our campus. He is an elite athlete, former Olympian and professional athlete, who was going to come and do some type of feats of strength and then share his testimony and the gospel message. During that presentation... He unfortunately suffered a cardiac arrest right there on the stage. For two minutes, no pulse. And by the way, don't get me wrong. I am so grateful to and thankful for those that were doctors and nurses and those had the skill sets to do what they did when they came upon the scene. But as empowered as they were with knowledge and their skill set, let me share with you what happened that night. Families gathered together in the courtyard and they began to pray. Teenagers began to put their arms around each other. We as a church body, we collectively prayed. And thankfully, two minutes later, a life that was, had no breath received breath again. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think it is by coincidence that the day before Vacation Bible School's Bible lesson was Lazarus? They actually saw the story come to fruition. You will never be filled with the Holy Spirit apart from prayer. It doesn't happen. Whether it's explicitly mentioned in Acts 4 at the beginning or toward the end, you never see it. But the other aspects you see, the second thing is perseverance. 
These individuals had had, had hostility toward, toward them. Notice what it says at the beginning of chapter 4. It says all these people began to gather. The high priest is there. Their neighbors are there. Their friends are there. And what did they do? Did they quit? No. Did they give up? Absolutely not. Did, did they say, okay, it's just getting a little too hot in the kitchen, so to speak. They persevered. See, in Acts chapter 1, they hung in there for seven days, even though Jesus didn't tell them how long it would be. They continued in their quest to be faithful to the things of the Lord in their lives. I think one of the things that the devil wants more than anything in your life, Christian, he just wants you to quit. He just wants you to give up. He just wants you to say, enough's enough. I have a friend of mine in another state who says, we serve the God of the two-minute warning. In other words, when you think the game's about to be over, when you think time's about to run out, he does like many great professional athletes. He brings a comeback to the situation. They prayed, they persevered. And here's the part that makes a few people uncomfortable. They proclaimed, they had proclamation, they actually spoke the name of Jesus. You know, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you cannot help but talk about what God has done in your lives. And I want you to see how this happens in verse 13. It says, and when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. Now stop there for just a moment. Peter and John stood up. They declared to people who had the legal authority to incarcerate them. People who they had respect for. People who they probably admired in the flesh. They stood up in boldness and they would not back down. They just said, hey, this is who Jesus is. I'm sorry, but you're going to have to deal with this. I know what some of you are thinking. Well, they were learned men, skilled men. They had a craft, right? No, 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 no. It says, and when they perceived they were unlearned, ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge that they had been with Jesus. No seminary training, no Bible college, no real experience. Let me tell you, the proclamation of, the proclaiming of who Jesus is in our life, that last statement, they perceived they had been with Jesus. I got news for you. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, it's not going to happen on 30 minutes Sunday morning. That's not going to do it. It's not going to happen a few minutes here or a few minutes there. They spent time with Jesus when they were, quote, in a worship service, when they were on the work site, when they were with their friends. Everywhere they went, they were in communion with the Lord. You want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You don't turn it on, turn it off. You don't make it about this hour or that hour. You persevere and you proclaim in whatever situation you find yourself in. And last but not least, persecution. The heat begins to build. The shackles go on. The mockery increases. We live in a world today where even we in the Western world are beginning to see the birth pangs of it and greater and more of what we might call persecution. And here's the question I, I have asked of me all the time. I say, people ask, do you think we're going to see more persecution? How bad do you think it's going to get? Do you think it's going to increase? I think that's the wrong question. Here's the question we ought to be asking ourselves. Why are we not being persecuted? Because if you'll notice that everybody who was filled with the Holy Spirit experienced some type of persecution in their lives. And so if it is your desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit, it never happens apart from prayer. It never happens to people who give in and get out, give out. It never happens to people who keep their mouth shut. And it never happens to those who avoid the difficult situations of life. The last question we have to ask ourselves is this. Well, then what does that look like? Because maybe today you're saying, well, I pray all the time. And, and I've been through some difficult stuff. And, and, I, and I've had some struggles. And is that just part of life? Is, am I really filled with the Holy Spirit? How do I know? This is the litmus test. For being filled with the Holy Spirit. I want you to turn to verse 32 of this passage. They have prayed. The building has shook. They're filled with the Holy Ghost. They spoke the word of God with boldness. Verse 32. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither said any of them. They have aught of the things which he possessed was his own. They had all things in common. In other words, they had a passion for other people. Not just a putting up with or a hanging out with. They passionately pursued making sure that other people's needs were met before their own. They made sure that those in other scenarios had what they needed more than what they wanted. Let me make this real practical for us today because this is what we struggle with. 
If you frequently, when it comes to your faith, when it comes to the expression of your faith, when it comes to the body of Christ, if you frequently use the words, I, my, me, myself, or mine, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. If your expression is, well, that's what I want. Too bad. What did they say? What do y'all need? If you say, well, that's just how I would do it. They said, how do you need it to be done? What we see here is a collective body of Christ, not a, well, this is what I want done in my life. One of the great litmus tests of being filled with the Holy Spirit is you are more concerned with somebody else's experience with the Lord than your own personal preferences or prejudices. But here's the second one. I noticed it got awfully quiet with that one. Verse 33. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses, they sold them. They brought the prices of the things that were sold. They laid them down at the apostles' feet. Distribution was made unto every man according to he had need. Now, don't read into this as some people have of, quote, Christian socialism or communism or such. I want you to notice the grammar, the syntax of this verse. Possessors of lands, plural. Houses, plural. Things, plural. In other words, being filled with the Holy Spirit isn't just a passion to make sure that others have and not just yourself. They were willing to allow themselves to be pruned. In other words, it was more important for somebody to have something than for them to have everything. It was more important for somebody to have access to that which they did not have access to than them to possess everything that they had the privilege of having. And that's not just material things, folks. Uh, that comes to our time and our ideas and such. Let me make this simple. You say, am I, am I filled with the Holy Spirit? Here's your easy litmus test. Is it about you? Because if it's about you, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. It's real simple. We are only filled with the Holy Spirit when it's about Him and them and you gets left out of the equation. Each and every one of us has the opportunity through faith in Jesus Christ to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I have just one last thing to ask of you today. When it comes to this subject matter, will you say to yourself, I've had a problem or I have have a problem. So you have the ability today to put those things behind and to be filled from this point to forward. Or you can remain adamant that you want it done your way and your style and in your perception. The choice is yours. The difference is will you or will you not be filled with the Holy Spirit? Let's pray with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. Today as we talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit, allow me to remind us you can't be filled with anything that you don't already possess. And maybe today as we talk about the person of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, maybe, maybe the proverbial light bulb came on and you realize, you know, you need Jesus. You, you need forgiveness. You need salvation. Being filled is great, but you just need the presence of the Holy Spirit. If that's you today in this place or maybe on the other side of the cameras, and I've got some great news for you. You don't have to sign up to take a bunch of classes. You don't have to check off a bunch of boxes. In fact, the Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And maybe that's you today. That calling on the name of the Lord, that doesn't have to take place out loud. In fact, you don't even have to say the same words that I might say. But allow me just to guide you and share with you what that might look like in your life. That conversation, that prayer might go a little something like this. God, today I just want to admit what you already know about me. I'm the problem. I've sinned. I've messed up. But I believe today that Jesus Christ is the only answer to my sin problem. God, I believe that Jesus Christ loved me so much and that he was willing to be born on my behalf. I believe that Jesus Christ loved me so much he was willing to live a sinless life on my behalf. I believe that Jesus Christ loved me so much that he was willing to pay the price for my sins on the cross and raise from the dead so I could be forgiven and I could be saved. God, today I don't have all the answers to all the problems of life, but I do know that Jesus is the answer to my sin problem. The best way I know how, 
I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm asking you to save me. I just want to turn my life over to you. With our heads still bowed, our eyes still closed. Maybe you're that person today. Just a moment, I'm going to pray. I would encourage you. I would welcome you just to step out, step forward. I'd love to have a conversation with you. would love to celebrate with you what the Lord is doing in your life. Lord, as we come to this time of decision, thank you. Thank you that you're the God of second chances. Thank you that you have not relegated us uh, to the backside of the shelf. Thank you that you have not turned your back or turned your face. But more than anything, all you desire is for your grace and your mercy and your love to be poured in and through and around our lives. Oh God, whatever it is today that needs to take place so that we are perfectly where you desire us to be, may we do so at this time. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. At our time of invitation, I'll be here at the front. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to Church family, if you'll be seated for just a moment, just an exciting day. In fact, we've got many exciting uh, decisions to share with you. But before we do so, I know many of you gave of your time and your resources to be a part of Vacation Bible School this week. So we want to take just a moment to give you a little video recap of Vacation Bible School 2018. You're going to see the images. You're going to see the kids, the grandkids. But one thing I want you to pay attention to is notice the text that is on the screen, the number of volunteers, the number of students, the number of decisions, an exciting time here on the campus at First Opelika. Here's a brief video about VBS, and then we've got some exciting decisions. <laughs> 